More than any government advisor in recent memory, the British press and, to a degree, the British public have been obsessed with Dominic Cummings. Cummings set himself the task of revolutionising British government. He's been dramatised by Benedict Cumberbatch in a C4 Channel 4 drama. And this May, I mean, we all spent about a month um, debating Dominic Cummings when he broke the lockdown rules and then Boris Johnson expended all of his political capital, undermined Britain's lockdown to defend Dominic Cummings having driven to Barnard Castle to test his eyesight. He has been, he's dominated um, political life in this country for over a year now. And now, as of today, he has gone. Um, so he has left Downing, he, he left Downing Street today with a box of his things. And we are told he is never going to return. He has resigned. Um, I'm going to be talking about that with Dahlia Gabriel. We will also um, be talking tonight about the latest coronavirus stats. Obviously, um, coronavirus does not wait for internal bust-ups in the Conservative Party to resolve themselves before, um, well, I suppose, spreading among us. Fairly grim. Um, we are also going to talk about a student occupation that's currently uh, taking place at Manchester University. I speak to two occupiers there. Um, a bizarre story um, seems to be that the government basically trolling ethnic minorities and anti-racists in this country by their latest appointment to the EHRC, the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And then finally, um, there was released the NEC results, the results to for elections to Labour's ruling body today. Um, some big results, big surprise. Um, you'll have to wait till the end of the show uh, for, for both um, you know, that news and our analysis. Um, before we go to our first story, you know the score, share the show link and tweet on the hashtag Tisky Sour. If you have any comments about Dominic Cummings, do you think him leaving is, is, is cause for relief among the British public? Do you think this is just an SW1 story and that ultimately Cummings was always a bit of a Wizard of Oz character? Uh, he always projected more power than he actually had. What do you think um, about Dominic Cummings' resignation? Let's take our minds back to the 25th of May, when the last shred of confidence the British public had in the government's coronavirus strategy was shattered by a government advisor speaking in the Downing Street Rose Garden. On Sunday the 12th of April, 15 days after I'd first, after I first displayed symptoms, I decided to return to work. My wife was very worried, particularly given my eyesight had seemed to, seemed to have been affected by the disease. She did not want to risk a nearly 300 mile drive with our child, given how ill I had been. We agreed that we should go for a short drive to see if I could drive safely. We drove for roughly half an hour and ended up on the outskirts of Barnard Castle town. We did not visit the castle, we did not walk around the town. We parked by a river. My wife and I discussed the situation. We agreed that I could drive safely, we should turn around and go home. I felt a bit sick. We walked about 10 to 15 metres from the car to the, to the riverbank nearby. We sat there for about 15 minutes. We had no interactions with anybody. I felt better. We returned to the car. An elderly gentleman walking nearby appeared to recognise me. My wife wished him happy Easter from a distance, but we had no other interaction. We headed home. On the way home, our child needed the toilet. He was in the back seat of the car. We pulled over to the side of the road. My wife and child jumped out into the woods by the side of the road. They were briefly outside. I briefly joined them. They played for a little bit and then, and, and then I got out of the car, um, went outside. We were briefly in the woods. We saw some people at a distance, but at no point did we break any social distancing rules. We then got back in the car and went home. So that was the disastrous press conference where Dominic Cummings explained to the public um, that he was right to drive from London to Durham in the middle of a lockdown when he had coronavirus, because even though him and his wife are both very well-connected London socialites, um, there was no one who could possibly look after their child in the hypothetical situation that they both became completely incapacitated at the same time, even though they're of the age group where you know the idea that any of them would have to go to intensive care is very... It, it would be a, a very rare phenomenon. Um, the clip you saw was obviously him explaining that he'd driven to a scenic town on a day that happened to be um, his wife's birthday, purely because he wanted to check his eyesight to check if he could drive back to London um, on the following day, even though I'm sure you know, you're going to be familiar with this story. Um, after that conference, 
And this is more important, Boris Johnson trashed his own reputation in a press conference immediately after that one from Cummings. I think he followed the instincts of every father and every parent, and I do not mark him down for that. And though there have been many other allegations about what happened when he was in self-isolation and thereafter, some of them palpably false, I believe that in every respect he has acted responsibly and legally and with integrity and with the overwhelming aim of stopping the spread of the virus and saving lives. So Boris Johnson's shameless defence of, of Dominic Cummings, his rewriting of the rules after the fact, not only undermined the government's lockdown strategy, um, I think that's probably one of the reasons why it's been a lot less effective the second time around, but it also completely trashed Boris Johnson's reputation. So it was after that moment that the, the Conservatives really lost many points in the polls and, and people flipped in terms of their, their interpretation of Boris Johnson and what he stood for. Um, and it does seem surprising that after trashing its entire um, you know, strategy on the most important issue of, of the day and their reputation. This is a government who, who care about their popularity. Boris Johnson loves to be popular. He expended so much political capital on this and only six months later, Dominic Cummings is out of the door anyway. Now over a, a personal tiff, um, it seems. I think we can see some images of, of Cummings coming out of, of Downing Street with his boxes full of his stuff. Um, some, some interesting context here, um, what um, lots of political journalists have been tweeting, is that there are many exits to number 10. There's a back door. It's not normal for staff to go through that front door. So this is Dominic Cummings wanting to have his moment in the sun. He's always been someone who loves attention. Um, so he, he clearly wanted to go out in a, in a theatrical way. Um, why is this happening now? Um, so we knew as of last night that Dominic Cummings was going to be resigning by the end of the year. Um, and this was broken by um, Laura Koonsberg, the BBC's political editor. Obviously, when I say broken, I mean she just copied and pasted a, a WhatsApp from Dominic Cummings and put it on Twitter, and that was called journalism. But anyway, um, let's get up her tweets from last night. Senior number 10 source says Dominic Cummings is out by Christmas. After hours of speculation, he tells me rumours of me threatening to resign are invented. Rumours of me asking others to resign are invented. He said tonight's rumours that somehow the Brexit negotiations are involved are invented and comical to anybody who knows what's happening in number 10. But when asked about rumours he would quit at Christmas, Cummings said... My position hasn't changed since my January blog, when he planned to make himself redundant by the end of 2020. He's off. Um, that blog he is referring to um, was the shout out that he made for, for weirdos and misfits um, to join him in government. Um, and you can, if you remember, the first person he hired ended up having to resign because of their comments about race on, online. Um, but his, his relevant comment in that blog was him saying, we want to improve performance and make me much less important and within a year, largely redundant. Um, now, Dominic Cummings did actually write this. Um, if you have a good memory, you'll remember that in his press conference in the Rose Garden, he made up that he had seen coronavirus in advance. Um, he told people to go check his earlier blogs, which he had edited after the fact. So he, he, he can be known um, to make up what he has said in the past. Um, he, he did genuinely say this, but... Um, to me, this doesn't really look like everything going according to plan. There's a couple of reasons for this. So one, in, in, in that comment from um, that blog, he says he wants to make himself largely redundant. That doesn't mean totally redundant. That doesn't mean he wants to quit. He's saying, I want all of the various tasks I'm doing to be distributed to people who are equally competent to myself. It's obviously how he thinks about the world. The second reason this doesn't really seem like just him fulfilling what he was always planning to happen is that comment was clearly him saying, I want to have made government so effective that I don't even need to be here. You know, the, the sign of a real leader is that they can create other leaders and basically government can tick along without me. Now, what is the context in which Dominic Cummings is resigning? It's clearly not the government has become so effective it doesn't need him anymore. We've had 15 U-turns in the last six months. The government's wasted billions on, on a malfunctioning test and trace system, billions on, on PPE that doesn't work, mainly to friends of friends of, of, of government ministers, um, and the highest death toll in Europe, tragically. Um, what is going on then? If this is not just that Dominic Cummings has decided that he's, he's been so effective, so successful in his role that he can um, you know, uh, step aside and, and let other people come through, 
it seems to be um, the result of a big power struggle within Downing Street, which for the first time, the Cummings faction is on the losing end of. I'm going to explain to you the background now. Um, again, this is a bit SW1. It's a bit, you know, Westminster-centric, but these are all important characters who, as me and Dahlia will discuss, will have sort of a big influence on the, on the form, the direction this government takes. So here we go. Lee Kane is the first person I need to introduce you to. Lee Kane was Cummings' biggest ally from the Vote Leave campaign. Um, until this week, he was Johnson's Director of Communications. Um, now, he resigned on Wednesday. The reason he resigned is because initially he was put out that Allegra Stratton, um, we can get her up now, she was hired as Johnson's new press secretary. Um, Lee Kane didn't want her in the job. He was worried that she would basically overtake his role as director of communications. He felt put out. Um, Dominic Cummings at the same time was pissed off um, because he knew, well, not he knew, it wasn't a secret, but Boris Johnson is looking for a chief of staff. He thought that was going to be a separate power base to his own. Now, Dominic Cummings, someone who's you know, good at coming up with plans, how they had decided or how he, ha how he and Lee Kane had decided to use this to their own advantage, they were going to try and put forward Lee Kane as the chief of staff. So he might have been supplanted in his comms role by Allegra Stratton, but maybe he could get an even, an even higher job. Um, uh, the fact that the job was going to go to Lee Kane was sort of leaked to the press. Um, it's debatable as to by whom. Then that appointment was blocked by Carrie Simmons, um, who is Boris Johnson's fiance. She also used to be a comms chief at the Tory party. Um, how this all ended up panning out is that Carrie Simmons managed to block the appointment of Lee Kane. Lee Kane, the, the promotion of Lee Kane, sorry, to chief of staff, that meant that Lee Kane resigned um, as director of communications. He walked out in a huff. And now Dominic Cummings has decided that if Lee Kane's gone, then this is a, a sort of defeat for his faction, which means he doesn't want to be there anymore. Or he was pushed out by Boris Johnson. In any case, what it shows is a sort of defeat of the vote leave faction within number 10 Downing Street. Dahlia, I think we can hear you now. Yeah, I hope so. Can Amazing. You hear me? We can hear Amazing. you. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> What do you think about this? Is this just an SW1 psychodrama or is this the kind of development that is going to matter in terms of how we're governed by this government? I mean, it, obviously it is to an extent just sort of Westminster sort of reshuffling, which happens all the time. Um, but I think it's more about what it signifies. And I think to me, you know, this really does have echoes from, from the, what actually happened over the US election where you saw... You know, and I think there's definitely parallels between the kind of relationship between the vote leave faction and the traditional Conservative Party um, and sort of Trumpism and the sort of traditional Republican Party. Um, and when we saw um, Trump's loss in the election, we saw Fox News sort of turning on him and calling Arizona early. And that kind of created it seemed that the Republican, the institutions of the Republican Party were kind of like, right. We need to let go of this guy and we need to kind of reorganize, get control back of our party. We were happy to sort of ride on the coattails of his win. But now that it's clear that he's probably, you know, when it was seeming that he was not going to win, which he hasn't, um, we're just going to kind of get rid of him and we're going to like spend the next four years regaining control of our party. And I think that that's something that is almost sort of playing out a little bit um, here. And I think that it might actually not be too disconnected from what happened in the US, you know, um, Boris's sort of very Trumpian style side, which is, you know, about stirring up culture wars, because that's the best terrain um, on which the Tories win, um, because they make very complex and, you know, class based issues into kind of like, um, you know, petty, petty fights. Um, but I think that like the loss of Trump in the US has sort of strike a blow to that kind of mode of governance, of stirring up cultures, of being very confrontational with the rest of his party. Um, and, you know, especially when it comes up to the Brexit negotiations, um, this kind of dangling of a no deal Brexit because we're going to get a really good deal with the US, that now has also been put um, under threat. So I think that um, when, you, when you put it in the context, in the broader context of kind of what Trump's loss means for that particular particular style of right-wing politics and the fact that it is kind of um, while it can work with the more institutionalized right wing it is somewhat different um, the fact within that broader context it feels like Boris is kind of 
collecting himself and sort of re-evaluating what the next 12 months looks like, and particularly with the Brexit deadline coming up, given that, you know, his biggest ally in the White House um, and the biggest ally for that kind of politics um, has lost the election. But I actually, um, you know, I think it shows how much of a stupid calculation um, he made in sort of throwing the whole pandemic response uh, strategy under the bus in order to defend Dominic Cummings, in order for him to just leave not that long after. Um, but I also think that it's actually not a good call from Boris because I think that, you know, again, that stoking up of, of culture war style politics, that is the terrain on which he wins. I don't think that he, um, you know, is going to kind of like get very far by trying to project himself as a more traditional um, traditional conservative. I think that connection to, to Joe Biden's victory is, is super interesting, partly because, I mean, what, what it made me think of is that basically Joe Biden, it was a very famous sort of, well, not famous, but it was, it was a long running theme basically of his campaign that he was going to get politics back to normal. You wouldn't have to talk about it over dinner anymore. That was Obama's mm. specific pitch. Imagine if Joe Biden wins, you won't have to have arguments anymore. And that was a very similar line, actually, to what the Tories put forward in, in 2019. I don't know if you saw it. There was sort of a, a really well-produced um, video that they paid to be sort of on the top of, of YouTube for a couple of days, which was sort of people fighting about Brexit. And they were like, vote Boris and we can stop politics. We can stop all the arguments and we can just get on with life. And it was a very effective campaign ad. I think that is one of the reasons why the Tories got that landslide, because people didn't want to debate this sort of tedious issue anymore. But then once Boris Johnson got that majority, Dominic Cummings couldn't fulfill that, that ambition. He couldn't fulfill that promise because he's just obsessed with starting fights. So uh, there was a bit of a desire, I think, in 2019 to say, OK, yeah, let's put politics to one side for a second. Let's just have a sort of competent government and we, we won't debate all of these ideologically sort of heated issues. But Dominic Cummings can't help it. And it does seem like Biden's victory has sort of made Boris Johnson feel like, oh shit, maybe all of this divisive right-wing populist stuff, maybe that does have a bit of a, a sell-by date, and he would prefer to go back to his, you know, what everyone talks about, his, his mayor of London model, which is, you know, he did, he did win in a, a liberal city, um, and he, he was supposed to sort of govern like a chairman, trying to keep everyone happy. Um, let's go to some analysis of this, because people are saying that, that that is the divide here between sort of a culture war politics or a, a more conciliatory um, traditional socially liberal, but also economically liberal, liberal conservatism. This is from a Times report and by Oliver Wright, uh, who's their Whitehall editor. One source said that Mr. Johnson wants to reset the government and make it less adversarial, ending the culture wars against institutions such as the BBC. The Prime Minister wants to focus on environmental issues, never a big priority for Brexiteers, and reset relations with his increasingly fracturous parliamentary party. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose my question, Dahlia, is that in a way, do you take some relief from this? Do you think this could be a sign that the, the government are going to try and move away from sort of the, the divisive culture wars attempts that they are sort of doing to try and stoke up drama about really sort of pointless things, which basically is, you know, they're trying to whip up racial resentment among white Britons. They've been trying to do it for a year over like statues. You were debating Ben Bradley, weren't you, on, on Politics Live, where he was sort of saying this idea that the National Trust want to um, potentially put up a few signs that tell you the actual history of the buildings that you're walking around. <laughs> he was like, this is, is anti-British. You know, uh, if Cummings goes, do you think that maybe Boris Johnson will be like, let's put a lid on this, this is silly. It's actually, you know, not that many people are are uh, persuaded by this. It hasn't worked for Trump. Let's just go for one nation conservatism. Um, I, I don't think so. I think, and I think that it doesn't, when it comes to that particular issue, um, I don't think it particularly matters what, uh, what Boris Johnson is doing or what his particular position is because, you know, the, the kind of, the, the, the stoking up of that kind of, of that kind of politics is done it's driven primarily by, you know, the newspaper media. It's driven by this kind of like rising, especially rising use of new media. It's been going on for many, many, many years and uh, many decades. In fact, um, it's just kind of reaching a particular um, peak, I think, with especially with sort of social media and with the sort of new sort of uh, material interests that lie in doing that kind of reorganizing capital in the wake of the crisis and stuff like that. 
Um, but so the, the institutions that peddle this kind of stuff um, are still going to continue to do so because it, I think I personally think it's kind of the only terrain um, on which the right can win. Um, and so what ha- the only difference is that Boris Johnson kind of was up, you know, was was giving comment on it and was kind of getting more involved in it than previous prime ministers have. But um, that doesn't mean that 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 sort of war is not going to continue on very, very much so. And especially with the presence of MPs like Ben Bradley um, and his so-called um, common sense uh, caucus or whatever it's called. Um, so I think that those forces are going to very much continue because it is central to to their strategy of, of winning. And I think it was central to the, the victory that they had in the 2019 election, and um, particularly in, in, with the fact that this stuff is being fought along, along through and alongside the Brexit, um, the Brexit debate. Do you think this is? Do you think culture wars are the only way for right wingers to to win? I mean, what about like Angela Merkel or something? She's sort of like an anti culture wars leader who has you know dominated German politics. I mean, I know Boris Johnson is a million miles away from Angela Merkel, who sort of exudes compassion and competence, even though she's of a centre right party. But uh, do you think there's no there's no route for Boris Johnson to go down? You know, look, I'm just kind of a liberal nice guy, and I'll sort of bumble along, and things will fundamentally stay kind of the same. Um, and I'll just try and stay as popular as possible for five years. Do you just think that's a, a no-go for him? But in a sense, Angela Merkel is almost like an exception, in a sense, in Europe and, and in North America, um, in the sense that, you know, across Europe we are, and across the Americas, we are still seeing, like, this kind of politics. But where we did see a massive defeat of it was certainly in New Zealand, um, so that is an example, that is again an example like Germany. But I think that Ger- you know, Angela Merkel is kind of almost a bit atypical in the fact that as the rest of Europe and as the rest of the, Amer- as, as America, the Americas has gone through this kind of polarization of, of the political spectrum uh, and this kind of very particular brand of, of right wing politics, um, that, that, you know, she's kind of the fact that, that, they, that Germany has managed to sort of somewhat retain a continuity in the face of that is uh is is very is very sort of atypical um but i think that especially someone like boris johnson i mean he is so his history is so associated with that kind of stuff i mean you know we and and that is the the kind of the the brand and the identity on which he has always built his political reputation i think now that his big you know mate in the white house has gone He's sort of going with his tail between his legs to the rest of the One Nation Conservatives um, in order to try and kind of back himself. But um, I, I mean, but you know, the Conservatives, I'm sure, are always willing to kind of look the other way. But I think you know that is just so central to his brand that I can't see him giving it up anytime soon. Mm. I want to um, another talking point that sort of come with the uh, the exit of Dominic Cummings is maybe the hope. Um, that this won't just be uh, a government run by a small circle of friends. Obviously, we've seen with with, with Cummings in that building, um, so many sort of contracts go out to friends of friends and to people who he personally trusts. You know, Dido Hardin gets given the whole test and trace system because it's like these guys sort of know her. They think, ah, oh, I understand her. She seems like a talented woman. Let's give her complete control. There's no open tender. Um, and people have thought, maybe now he's gone, this can be a more sort of professional, even meritocratic um, organization. I'm going to crush all of those hopes um, because as, as we've sort of mentioned, the people who it seems like this is going to empower is people like Allegra Stratton and Carrie Simmons who are sort of encouraging Boris Johnson to be a bit less divisive, to stop starting unnecessary battles within the, the parliamentary party. And I think particularly they want him to stop going to war with the press because they're like, look, we're the Conservative Party. We should have all of the press on side. You know, we're, we're the party of business. We're the party of the establishment. But you've started these sort of unnecessary fights that don't seem to be going anywhere. Um, so people have said, maybe, maybe we're moving to a more sort of traditional system. I want to get up how all of these people are connected, though, because whilst sort of one, one sort of quite incestuous network might be on its way out, the people on their way in are just as interconnected in a sort of elite club. Um, let's get up this graphic from, it was originally in the Sunday Times. Um, so you can see there Boris Johnson in the middle and it's sort of laying out all of the connections between the different people. And let's focus on the people who have gone first. Um, so to Boris Johnson's right, you can see Dominic Cummings, chief advisor to Johnson. And he is married to Mary Wakefield, 
who used to work with Boris Johnson at the Spectator. So you see very close um, connections. This is sort of a, a bit of a, a chums club. Um, then you've got, but, and this is, <laughs> this is important to know, Allegra Stratton is basically who is now coming into the fold. She's newly empowered. She herself is married to another um, journalist at The Spectator. So she's married to James Forsyth, who's political editor at The Spectator. So we're moving power from one person who's married to a Spectator journalist to another person who's married to a Spectator journalist. We've talked about the close networks between Allegra Stratton, James Forsyth, and Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak was the best man at James Forsyth's wedding because they both went to Winchester, a very elite private school together. Um, obviously, Carrie Simons is, is the fiance of Boris Johnson. So, I mean, if you if you sort of map how all of these people are connected, it is so, it's this really tight elite network. So few jobs go out to open tender. You can see also you've got two, two more advisors there who happen to be married. Manira Mirza, head of number 10 policy union, and Dougie Smith, who's an advisor to Boris Johnson. Um, so many arrows, old friends, all these people, you know, they went to university together. So you're basically, whilst this is sort of painted as, as a, a war between two factions of politicians, it's almost, you know, a war between two sides of a, of a different friendship group. I'm going to go to a couple of tweets. So Joe Skeeping tweets on the hashtag Tisky Sour. It's hilarious to revisit the ludicrous behavior of Cummings in March, but I don't think his departure makes a big difference. The incompetence, corruption and cronyism of this government goes right to the top. Um, I mean, it definitely goes to the top in terms of Boris Johnson. I think that that does appear to be true. There was, I mean, I was in a way, you know, interested in, in the Dominic Cummings experiment in government because one of his big selling points was that he was saying i don't buy into tory dogma i'm not really a conservative what i want to do is the kind of industrial policy which hasn't been adopted in this this country for a while. what i want to do is use the state to create sort of dramatic innovations and create a really well functioning society he seems sort of almost inspired by the chinese communist party and obviously he was going to sell this with a huge dose of culture war sort of trying to stoke fear and hatred when it came to things like trans rights, when it came to migration. But on, on the economic level, it seemed like maybe there'll be some interesting things happening here. That's not what happened at all. I mean, as I say, he came in with, I mean, I, I think always the, the cons massively outweighed the pros when it came to Dominic Cummings, but he at least came in with some sort of interesting ideas as to what he was going to do to the British economy. And none of them have, have come to to life at all, you'd say, oh, it hasn't been very long. But where he has had an opportunity to get involved in, in projects and try and make them work, he hasn't. He's just, he's just adopted exactly the same sort of neoliberal systems and structures that have failed us for decades. So, I mean, he just seems to me more of the same, but ruder um, is, is probably going to be his legacy. Um, Chris Tyson with a quid super chat as well. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on because obviously, as I say, I think this does matter. I think Cummings leaving probably will have an effect on sort of how this government functions, at least sort of in terms of the battles it's it's picking, um, which will you know, matter to people. But it's not obviously um, the most important thing going on in Britain right now. That's the pandemic. Um, before we go on to the latest stats with respect coronavirus, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Um, hit that subscribe button, hit notifications if you want to be informed every time we go live. So on to the pandemic. Today's release of ONS data on COVID-19, so that's the Office for National Statistics, came with some good news. And um, so the virus appears to be leveling off. This is a graphic from the BBC based on those ONS, or based on that ONS data. Um, and you can see there that whilst the number of people with infections um, number of daily community infections in England, so every, people catching it every day, was going up quite dramatically um, from the end of September to the end of October. It has sort of slightly leveled off in that final week of October, probably because of sort of some of the new restrictions which were coming into play. So exponential growth isn't happening. That's a very positive thing. Um, and to sort of and also, yeah, and very much related, obviously, is that the government scientists are now saying that the R rate has fallen. Um, to between 1 and 1.2, which is the closest it's been to 1 since September. So obviously some of the new restrictions are working. Um, to remind ourselves where the R has been, um, this was a slide from the, the Chief Scientific Advisor's press um, briefing um, at the end of October, and you can see there that sort of towards the end of September, the R is just rocketing, and you're seeing there that's going to be exponential growth, and it's been falling ever since um, the end of September. Um, that's the good news. Um, now for the bad news, 
is that even though we're not looking at exponential growth anymore, the epidemic seems to be stabilizing at a very, very high level. Um, so the ONS survey that I just referred to um, that shows sort of the, the, the levels of, of transmission are stabilizing also showed that one in 85 people in England have COVID-19 currently, or they did two weeks ago when this, when this data came out. There's a week's lag in that data. If the R is just over one, as they say, is we can imagine it's a little bit higher than one in 85. So just you know, pluck a number out of there, maybe it's one in 80. Now that's a lot of people with coronavirus. And what seems very clear is that none of the restrictions which are currently in place are going to bring the R number, you know, maybe, maybe a tiny bit below one, but what you are going to see is this level of infections, one in 85 people having coronavirus, potentially, unless something dramatically changes, all winter. And we can already see what the implications of that are going to be in terms of deaths. So this is the latest um, analysis, the latest data on the number of people who are dying with coronavirus or dying 28 days after a positive or within 28 days of a positive test. Um, and as you can see, this is, this is going up the, the current sort of seven day average is about 355. So we're sort of in a position, which is basically because all of these restrictions came way too late. The government said, let's wait and see how things go. Ultimately, we only introduce restrictions when it's too late. Um, obviously, the test and trace system wasn't working as it should do. And so what it seems will, will happen is that we're in basically a fairly stable status quo and where the virus isn't rocketing out of control, but where we can expect about 350 people to die every day all winter until a vaccine comes about, and unless there's some sort of dramatic change and the government haven't explained what that would be yet. I mean, if, if they were to be ambitious, what that would be would be a really strong circuit break where you close everything for two weeks and get up and running a test and trace system that works. That, that's the kind of um, intervention you could see, which would mean that we don't have 350 deaths um, every day. But um, I don't have that much faith the government is going to be able to achieve that. Let's go on to our next story. One of the big reasons the R rate rocketed in mid-September was the government policy to encourage students to move back onto campus. That decision had obvious epidemiological costs. <laughs> Moving um, people from all over the country to, to meet and live with loads of new people meant that you had these huge explosions um, of coronavirus in some of Britain's biggest cities, and that spilled out. It was always going to. It also had big costs to students. Obviously, students are, are of the age group who are least likely to end up having to go to hospital with coronavirus, but they did find themselves locked in their halls, paying high fees to sit on Zoom, um, taking lectures they could have taken at home. Um, we have seen um, since I mean, the shocking decision was made to encourage and almost pressure students to go back to their campuses, students fighting back. Um, so two weeks ago, my colleague Rivka Brown um, wrote about the wave of rent strikes which were taking place in British universities. Earlier this week at Manchester, there were protests after Harris fencing was erected all around the campus. So it seemed to be to try and keep people in. Um, a very authoritarian response to a coronavirus outbreak. We can take a look at the protests now. Student mental health is at an all-time low this year. We're being forced into this situation and now we are being blamed for what is happening. It is not our fault. It is not our fault. <laughs> Students obviously quite rightly being pissed off at being blamed for the spread of coronavirus when they were told to go back into those halls. Um, now, since that that protest, students at Manchester University have gone into occupation. I spoke earlier today to Lucy Nichols and Hannah Phillips from the occupied block. We're occupying the Owens Park Tower, which is in, in the Owens Park uh, Fallowfield campus of the University of Manchester. There's 10 to 15 of us occupying. Um, and we're occupying, I think, is a bit of a last resort just because of how much, like, there's how many, how many protests there's been over the last two months and the extent to which they've just been completely ignored by university. And where they haven't been ignored, they've just been met with police and fences and, and you know, Nancy Rothwell, our vice chancellor, blaming us for ignoring the problem or pretending she didn't know what was going on. So I think that's, that's why we're here. Yeah, we've got um, students from several different groups. So there's the UOM rent strike um, who organised it. who are all withholding their rent in strike, which is going really well. And we've got us from 9K for what? Um, we've got students before profit as well in here. Um, so yeah, it's a real collaborative effort. As far as I understand it, it seems like the, the university have been pretty 
authoritarian in, in their response to your, to your protest. There was obviously, you know, that situation where it seemed like they'd fenced everyone into the halls. Could you talk about the, the, the treatment of, of you guys from Manchester University? Yeah, I mean, in terms of, um, obviously, there was the fencing issue, which was really big in the media. But then also last night, SAFER, um, a group who uh, were organising a protest um, outside at the foot of the tower for yesterday evening, um, and they had done a full risk assessment and the protest was going to be corona friendly and peaceful. And um, yeah, they got threatened from police and told that um, they would be fined massively. So they called off the protest and the protest was completely cancelled. There was still a huge police presence on the campus last night. They had two riot vans um, and I don't know how many, but a large, large police presence um, filming students. So students were protesting out of their windows instead of um, out on the square. Um, and they were shouting out the windows in support. I think a few of them came out in front of their house. Um, but yeah, the police were intimidating and filming students. It's really like the university's response, instead of responding to us in a kind of supportive way, they, do, yeah, they choose to threaten us and think that they can like terrify us into listening to them. And, and I suppose, f finally, could I get you to talk about, you know, the level of support does is this occupation seen as divisive by any students maybe because people are, are concerned about people all occupying a building together how have sort of teachers and staff members sort of approached this occupation what do you feel like the how, how's this being received we've had like an unbelievable outpouring of support not just from students in manchester um in fallowfield but from like all over the country, you know, we had SOAS, the Unison branch, send us a message of solidarity. We had Glasgow Tenants Union send us a pizza. So it's been just overwhelmingly love. Like even in Fallowfield, I've not had, I've not seen anywhere, posted anywhere, any messages saying, oh, why are they occupying the tower or anything like that. Um, it's been overwhelmingly supportive. And also the UMECU has been fantastic. And, and, and yeah, so it's safer in all the groups that aren't involved that want to lend solidarity. Yeah, we've had students bringing us any food we can wish for, um, everyone doing their best to get food to us. We've had students dancing in front of us on the square, um, holding up signs and messages of solidarity for us. And yeah, like you say, lots of groups as well. And seeing solidarity forever through the window for us. <laughs> so that was Lucy Nichols and Halla, Hannah Phillips talking to us um, from their occupation in Manchester. Lovely to hear about all the solidarity which being sent their way. Obviously, we, we reiterate all of that at Navarra Media. Solidarity to all students who sort of are, are living through this very difficult time and have basically been taken for a ride by the government and by their universities. Our total solidarity to all the rent strikers, all the occupiers out there. Um, and we all know, you know, as, as we talked about on Wednesday, actually, all of us at Navarra Media understand how sort of formative, how significant student movements can be um, in terms of you know, developing our, our politics and building movements which can last for, for future struggles. So um, all, all power to you. Um, we're going to go on to our next story in one moment. I'll, I'll be able to get Dahlia in at some point, but we are still having a few problems with the sound, but we will um, keep you posted. Um, first of all, let's go straight on to our next story. Back in July, we interviewed Bassett Mahmood from Newsweek about his piece on the lack of black and Muslim representation on the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Um, he reported the body which is charged with enforcing equality law in Britain did not have a single black or Muslim member on its 10-person committee. What was worse, two previous commissioners, one black and one Muslim, said they lost their roles for being too loud about racism. This is not the kind of thing that should be reported about the body which is charged with enforcing equalities law. There was pressure then um, when the government sort of advertised four new commissioners to hire some people from black or Muslim backgrounds. Um, as far as I understand, the board has hired um, someone of a, of a Muslim background um, to be chair. Um, these four roles, though, this is when people are saying you need, you need now to, to hire someone from a, from a black background. Obviously, if, you're, if your task is to enforce um, racial equality laws in this country, you need to have a diverse set of, of people on the panel. Um, so yesterday they did announce that one person from a black background, a black man, would be on the panel. That is Tory peer Lord Ribeiro. Um, he is a former president of the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, he's going to be on the panel for a year, mainly to advise about the, the unequal impact of COVID-19. The second new appointment is Sue Mae Thompson. She's a CEO of an organisation that seeks to increase minority representation in the media. So far, so uncontroversial, although I'm not that sure if a, a, a body which is tasked with 
holding the government to account, or at least should be, should be, you know, should have quite so many Tory peers on it. But anyway, that's a slightly different issue. Um, third, we have Jessica Butcher. She is a tech entrepreneur. Now, I googled her, and the first thing that came up was this. Um, it's a video with the the fairly right wing trigonometry podcast um, titled Jess Butcher: Women in Tech Aren't Oppressed. And I also looked on her Twitter, which is mainly full of retweets from The Spectator magazine. Now, this very much fits into the trend which this government have of appointing people to equalities boards or equalities commissions who don't really believe um, that inequality is a big problem. They spend more time intervening to say, oh, maybe we're, maybe we're all equal after all. Um, though, uh, we need to consider, though, Butcher is not the most controversial appointment to the equalities board. That goes instead to David Goodart. He is the fourth appointment. Um, to the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Now, he is controversial because they have given David Goodart a, a role in tackling racism in Britain. But his past interventions on this topic are, you know, nearly without exception, always to say, oh, racism, not that big a problem. You know, <laughs> this is very much in the pattern of this government. Um, let's go through a few of the examples of when David Goodart thought, oh, this is a good time for me to say racism, ah, not that big a deal. Uh, the first is when, with relation to the Windrush scandal. So this is how Goodart responded um, to the government having deported a lot of people who had every right to be here but didn't have the paperwork from the 1970s that they were supposed to have. So people who had lived here from their childhoods were deported um, to countries they had no experience of living in. Um, in response, David Goodart wrote this article, How Do We Cut Illegal Immigration by Policing Britain's Internal Border? So essentially defending um, the, the hostile environment. We can go to a quote from that. The Windrush scandal was an error of overzealous control, and my report has suggestions for avoiding a re repeat of this egregious mistake, but Windrush must not lead to a radical watering down of the so-called hostile environment. That was his response to the Windrush scandal. Uh, now we can go to his response to the Black Lives Matter protests, obviously provoked um, by people's experience um, of what we know, you know, it, it's proven with statistics um, that our police do behave in a discriminatory way to non-white people. Um, his response to this um, was this article in Unheard, you see facts versus feelings in the BLM debate. The statistics tell a broadly positive story about black middle class advancement. Let's go to the, I think, what is the key quote from that article. He writes, when BLM supporters use evidence to support their arguments for systemic racism, it usually runs like this. Take the black population in the UK of 3% and then point to big overrepresentation in terms of in bad things. Prison population, stop and search, deaths in custody, being, being sectioned, unemployment, and overrepresentation in good things. Top professions, Oxbridge, football management, parliament, corporate boardrooms. He goes on. This is statistically naive. The overrepresentation of black people in prison at 12% of the total should not be looked at in relation to the total black population, but rather to those involved in serious crime. In recent years, black people accounted for around 20% of robbery convictions and 15% of murder convictions. Apparent disproportionality also falls away for stop and search when you focus on who is in the streets in the place it happens, deaths in custody and being sectioned, but not for higher rates of unemployment, which was at least moving in the right direction prior to the crisis. So this is a classic, to, this, is, this is what all of the people in Downing Street love at the moment, is to say, oh no, the reason why um, black people are overrepresented over in the criminal justice system is because they commit more crime. That's essentially um, what he's saying. He's, he's got no interest in asking, why is it the case that more people from ethnic minority communities are driven to crime? Because there's obviously a big class element here. It's about opportunities. Um, but also, I mean, you, it doesn't account for that. If you look at what Ash talks about, the, the, the idea that the number of people who get stops and search for drugs, it, you, you're way more likely to get stops and search for drugs if you're black than if you're white, even though white people take just as many drugs as, as black people. So one, this is statistically, well, I wouldn't call it statistically naive, I'd call it statistically disingenuous. Um, but you can see here what he's talking about. If there are inequalities, that's the fault of the ethnic minority. Now let's go on to Islamophobia. This was Goodart's intervention during the war on terror. So this is when pressure on Muslims was you know, at its strongest. He says, it's paranoia, not Islamophobia. It says, Britain has done much to help integrate Muslims. Now they must rise above their grievance culture. So he's there saying that Islamophobia is just an issue of grievance. Um, now, and finally, no, I've got two more, actually, because as an academic, good arts principal contribution, this is probably the worst, actually. Um, this is an article in the FT, and he is defending something he calls white self-interest. So he says, white people wanting to protect the interests of white people 
and especially this is about white majorities, is not itself racism, that's white self-interest. We have to understand that that's ultimately fine. Can we get up that headline? Um, there you can see white self-interest is not the same thing as racism, accepting that all groups have legitimate interest fosters mutual understanding. Um, I don't, mutual, why do white people need to have interest as white, what, what would that look like? Very bizarre. Um, and this is the icing on the case. This is a different piece in the FT, um, a profile of himself. Um, no, it's an article by him actually sort of talking about his life and career. He says, I've grown used to being accused of racism even by my own children. Um, so the EHRC, there was complaints made about it that it wasn't sufficiently independent, that it wasn't um, representative enough of, of black and brown people in this country. And in response, the Tories have put one black person on the commission, but sort of to balance it out, in case you were worried that the commission was becoming too woke, they've put on someone, a white guy, who is accused of racism even by his own children. Even by his own children. Dahlia, I want to go to you. I mean, what do you think of this appointment? But also, is this just the government trolling? I mean, th this seems to clearly be them leaning into culture wars, but also, I mean, this just seems so brazen, it's hard to believe, right? I mean, first of all, that is absolute. I love it when racists just tell on themselves. They're like, yeah, my children call me racist, but it's because the children are wrong um, and everyone else is like wrong except for me. And it's just sort of like, OK, God knows what the fuck is happening inside your household, because if the way that you move outside is like a tempered version of what goes on inside, I hate to think what is going on. Um, but, you know, I mean, obviously it is incredibly disconcerting um, at a time when, you know, um, there are, as we've mentioned previously, there are a lot of interests in sort of stoking up um, hatred and racial terror, um, not just in terms of kind of stoking up racism, but actually like intensifying the mechanisms of racial terror, whether it's incarceration or um, the hostile environment. Uh, and, you know, or economic violence in, in very many ways to have um, the elevation of someone who has uh, denied that and who is speaking like a white nationalist um, in a commission like this is, is incredibly worrying. But what I want, would say about this is that I think that this is a very naive move by the government, because what the government are trying to do is they're seeing the, the locus of anti-racist power in these kinds of institutions, which were sort of set up um, in, you know, I often refer to it uh, in Paul Gilroy's 1990 essay, where he talks about like the end of anti-racism and the idea that sort of anti-racism moved from being this like cross-class, um, you know, or primarily working class actually, but like cross, you know, inter sort of racial solidarity um, street movement that was active in workplaces, was active in cultural spaces and had sort of a really, particular analysis of capitalism and, and, and what the end goal was and the sort of co-option of that into kind of like bureaucratic state bodies that kind of see this all as like, um, you know, just like kind of something that can be fixed with, with reports. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing now with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement is kind of um, a, a signal that, you know, we've had 20 years of that and nothing much has changed. In fact, a lot of things have gotten a lot worse. And we're seeing the kind of power to um, kind of the power and authority to engage on this issue is moving away from institutions like this and back onto the streets. And I think that the the attempt to kind of co-opt and to sort of like mess around with and meddle with these kinds of institutions is almost it's, it's too late. Um, and it's sort of an attempt to put a lid on the clear rising um, consciousness that is taking place, particularly amongst working class black and brown people. And, you know, this posturing of the EHRC as like a key anti-racist institution, I can guarantee you that the vast majority of black and brown people in this country have never heard of them. Um, my dad can't even get the order of the letters right, despite me trying to tell him like millions of times. He's just not interested. It doesn't affect his life. Um, but I think that, you know, the, this is a sort of this is the the kind of attempt to see these institutions as their enemies. So thinking that if they just change the people within these institutions, they can dampen the kind of increase in consciousness. But the, the, the two things are not related. You know that the street mobilizations and the consciousness that is happening, particularly amongst young people, um, is coming out of material conditions. It's not coming out um, from these kinds of bureaucratic um, institutions. So it might seem like a short term win. 
um, for this kind of politics, but it's really the Tories um, and the states, as it were, trying to put a plaster um, on a gunshot wound. Mm. Well, I mean, I think in a way it seems almost dangerous for them to be this brazen about it because, you know, I don't think the HRC is, you know, it's not very challenging to the government. As we've seen, you know, the investigation it did was about the opposition party. It didn't it ignored requests to, to investigate Islamophobia in the Conservatives. It didn't have much to say at all about the hostile environment. So you've, you've already got an organisation which seems fairly pliant um, to the, what the, the government wants. Um, and now they're almost sort of tarnishing the reputation it has for um, independence. Whether or not that was warranted is up for question. Um, I want to go to return to um, a report which was released this week. We spoke about it on Wednesday, but it's incredibly relevant to this conversation, um, which was from um, the Parliamentary um, Committee on Human Rights, which found also that the EHRC, the problems with this organization go way before you know, the appointment of, of David Goodart. Um, so they concluded in this report, we find that the Equality and Human Rights Commission has been unable to adequately provide leadership and gain trust in tackling racial inequality in the protection and promotion of human rights. For the EHRC to be and to be and seen to be effective, black people must be represented at the top level of the organization, including as commissioners. Um, now, obviously, that's a very reasonable thing to say, very underreported, I think, because people have a certain um, interest in not asking any questions about certain organizations. Um, the, the bigger point here, though, is I think, is it a good idea for the government to be choosing the commissioners? If, if this is supposed to be an independent organization which holds powerful institutions to account, is it a good idea that you can basically just have Tory ministers choosing people who you know, are incredibly aligned to their politics. Two of these appointments, well, one of these appointments is a Tory peer. Um, two of the appointments are people who have very publicly expressed the kind of ideas which are very strong in, in the Conservative Party, which is that, you know, oppression, nah, doesn't really exist that much. Um, now, you might think, maybe it should be more independent. Maybe it should have more powers. This was actually in the Labour Party 2019 election manifesto. Um, this was their race. This was in their race and faith manifesto launched by Dawn Butler. Um, they promised to enhance the powers and functions of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, making it truly independent to ensure it can support people to effectively challenge any discrimination they face. Now, in light of the report from the Human Rights Committee and in light of um, this news about David Goodhart, like a sort of government ally um, with some you know, quite... Uh, worrying opinions, really, when it comes to racism being appointed, you might think actually it being independent would be a very good thing. Um, now, I just want to take us back because I don't think we should forget how dishonest and unfair, really, so many people were to some very reasonable suggestions made by um, Corbyn's Labour um, when this proposal, this very reasonable proposal was put forward. So after the release of that manifesto, John Woodcock, notable mainly for having met the King of Saudi Arabia and then lobbying in support of their criminal assault on Yemen, um, told The Independent, Jeremy Corbyn has brought the once decent Labour Party so low that it is desperately trying to threaten and undermine the credibility of the irreproachable Equality and Human Rights Commission rather than face up to the truth about its anti-Semitism. That's John Woodcock there, um, famous anti-racist who spends so much time lobbying for the bombing of poor people in Yemen. Um, he, he is saying that the EHRC is irreproachable. Do you think he asked any communities of colour whether the EHRC was irreproachable? Do you think he had any interest in the fact that there were no black people or Muslim people on the commission? No, because he was only out. He was, he was pretending, essentially pretending to be an anti-racist to attack Jeremy Corbyn. Now we can go to, this was a spokesman for the Jewish labour movement speaking to Politics Home. We're so, this was in response to that manifesto commitment. We're so through the looking glass when Labour says it will create a truly independent EHRC. There's nothing wrong with the EHRC, but there is with a party which is being formally investigated for institutional anti-Jewish racism, only the second inquiry of its kind. Now, I'm not here to say, oh, the EHRC, bullshit. You know, as, as we've said on this, on this show before, there's quite a lot in the EHRC report into Labour anti-Semitism, which is very useful, which should be taken on board. Um, but the problem I have is people saying, well, uh, uh, for us not to dismiss it, we have to say there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. And what this says to me is that, you know, you haven't asked that many people, right? If, 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 if there are people who are saying there are some things wrong with this, you know, if they're disproportionately from black and Muslim communities, then maybe you should listen. Um, and finally, Wes Streeting, um, quote tweeting Dawn Butler, who obviously had responsibility for the Race and Equalities Manifesto. She was Shadow Minister for Equalities. Um, Streeting writes, why did the Labour's 
why did the Labour Party's Race and Faith Manifesto, which you published, include a reference to making the EHRC truly independent, if not to discredit it? What, if anything, have you said and done as Shadow Equality's Secretary to address our own toxic anti-Semitism crisis? And that was in response to Dawn Butler tweeting um, about anti-Semitism. Now, again, there you've got someone just with, with a total lack of curiosity about what concerns people might have about the EHRC, especially black people and Muslim people, as we've seen from, from this report from the Equalities, no, sorry, from the Human Rights Committee in Parliament, and as we've seen from that reporting from people like Bassett Mahmood. And you've got all of these people who are lining up claiming to be sort of these, these strong, prominent voices on anti-racism who are basically just making stuff up to attack Jeremy Corbyn. And I do think we should not forget that. Dahlia, I want to bring you in for your, your thoughts on how certain all of these people on the labor right were that there was nothing anything at all wrong and i again i'm not here to try and delegitimize the ehrc what i am here to say is that if you claimed back in 2019 that there was absolutely nothing wrong with the ehrc to suggest so was itself disgraceful then how do you feel when you read this report which says that the ehrc has failed to show leadership for for black people in Britain? How do you feel um, when you've said, oh, the, the HSC was already independent enough and now they've employed David Goodart, someone who is a defender of white self-interest to sit on it and hold the government to account? How do you feel now? How do they I feel? feel? I know I'm not talking to yeah, you, Dali. I mean, you, you, you weren't someone who dismissed these complaints. <laughs> I mean, it's incredibly disgusting. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, watching Wes Streeting lecturing Dawn Butler on racism really is, it, these people have no self-awareness. And, and as far as I'm concerned, any institution that does not consider the hostile environment, which is the primary matrix of racist legislation or one of the, mo the most significant pieces of racist legislation in this country right now, that does not consider the hostile environment to be something of interest, there is no way that you can argue that, that that institution is independent because anyone who is independent, anyone who has a pair of eyes and ears can see and, and by just looking at the data. So and, and even just seeing even just like taking the name of it, the way that they've even named it themselves, um, that the aim is to make, you know, Theresa May says um, that the aim is to make Britain a really hostile environment. Um, for 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 migrants in this country, she used the word illegal, but we we know that she she means much you know, and even even so, um, it always comes out as racist in racist terminology. We know exactly what she means um, by that. She means anyone that could be assumed to be um, in that way. So like the the fact that like they don't see the hostile environment to be a, something that should be of interest to them tells me that this is a deeply flawed organization. And that's before you get to all of the white self-interest stuff. But again, what I would say is that, you know, I don't know how we've gotten into a position where people like Wes Streeting and um, Woodcock are, are able to um, talk about a once, once decent Labour Party. Oh, the Labour Party that invaded Iraq and killed a million Iraqis. Is that, is that the one that you mean? or, you know, is able to hold this kind of authority, um, not that I think they have any authority, but is able to feel, feel emboldened to use the very serious issues of race and racism as political footballs in such a shameless and unaccountable way. And it goes to the fact that our media has no interest in holding um, them to account and holding them to their own records. Um, I don't know how we got into a situation like that. And, and we need to kind of really, really reflect, I think, as an anti-racist movement on where the discourse at a national level is going. But again, what I would say is that all of these people are completely out of touch with the communities that they are speaking so confidently about. So I wouldn't put too much into this. I think it matters within the very small kind of political circles. But the actual anti-racist work, the anti-racist mobilization that is actually going to bring about change, that is going to continue happening regardless of all of these kinds of shenanigans. So in any, in any sense, you know, on the one hand, it is deeply insulting, but on the other hand, they're just showing us who they are. So it's about time that we believe them. I think that's a, a very important message to end that section on believe them when they you know, show us who they are.
Um, we're going to go on to a, another Labour story. This is breaking news. Um, well, it was breaking news about two hours ago. Um, we have, before actually I start this, it's going to be about the NEC elections, but before, let's go to some tweets and comments. Um, Nick Furious, love the name, um, with a fiver. I hope you guys reach 100k soon. You've become my favourite source of news and discussion during this mental year. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, thank you for the kind words. Um, we're, we're delighted to have a, I don't know if you're a new viewer. Anyway, it's been a long day. Raphael Aprut or Aprut Ap with 23.99. Tisky Sour has really helped me through this dark year. Keep up the amazing work. Also, shout out to me as it's my birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Raphael, for tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for your donation and the kind words. I hope you have a brilliant day. Um, going for a walk, because that's the only thing that's allowed, really. Um, Supita Dematagoda with 4.99. Thank you so much. And Nigel Fre Freyla, Freyla Chilo with a tenor. Just wanted to help support independent media. Hope you guys can keep growing. I hope we can keep growing. I'm sure we can keep growing, but we do need all of your support. So thank you so much for the super chats. Thank you to our regular donors. And if you are not already um, a regular donor to Navarra Media, please do go to navarramedia.com forward slash support and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. It makes this show possible. It makes the whole organization possible. Also, I do want to say, I've been reading, you know, I had a scroll yesterday through Navarra Media articles. Such high quality, really, really good pieces. So I really recommend if you enjoy the, the Tisky Sour show, do go to the website and look up some of the articles. James Meadway had a really good one on, on vaccines yesterday and Aaron had a really good one um, on the aging political class in, in the United States. So do check that out. And if you like what you're reading, make a donation. Um, we're going to go to our final story. Today we found out the results of elections to Labour's ruling body, the National Executive Committee. It was good news for the left. So of the nine seats elected in the CLP section, that's the constituency Labour Party section, um, the momentum-backed slate won five of the nine seats. That compares to three seats for the slate backed by Progress and Labour First, so that's the Labour right, and one seat for Open Labour, so they're the representatives of the soft left. Um, the left-backed candidates also won the disabled member seat on the NEC, which went to Ellen Morrison, congratulations, and the young member's seat, which went to Lara McNeil, who you'll probably know because she's been on this show many times before. Congratulations to Lara. Um, and yeah, this was a significant victory for the left. People were not sure that the left would outperform the right in these internal elections, and it seems to have been actually pretty, pretty clear cut. Um, this is Sienna Rogers' take. Um, she is the, the chief journalist at Labour List, so it's sort of a non-factional um, organization tends to give fairly objective takes when it comes to the Labour Party. She writes, Labour left definitely have done better than expected here, winning both youth and disabled rep posts and five local party reps, though this is down two on their previous number of members' reps. So you can see most people in the Labour Party agreeing these are very good results for the left. You might ask, though, if these are so good, if these results are so good for the left, why is Sienna Rogers saying that the left are down two on their previous number of members' reps? If, if it's a good result, how can you have done worse than you did last time? The answer is um, that the voting system was changed. Um, so the members used to be, or the members' representatives used to be voted by a sort of winner takes all. So if the left slate won, then all nine people from the left slate would go on to the NEC. Now it's single transferable vote, which means it's very difficult for any slate to win more than five because you sort of rank your, your preferences and you're always going to end up with a bit of a plural outcome. In theory, very good voting system. In practice here, it's one which gives Keir Starmer a permanent majority on the NEC because the members only make up nine of about 40 people on the NEC and so many of them come from the PLP and from friendly trade unions, trade unions that are friendly to, to Keir Starmer, um, that you know he, he basically has an inbuilt majority. So whilst this shows um, the strength of feeling amongst the, the left within the Labour Party, and it's very important actually to show this is the direction that the Labour members want to go in, what we want. Um, is to have a party which is fighting for left policies of the kind that we had under Jeremy Corbyn. I don't think, you know, people don't want Jeremy Corbyn back as leader. They want him back in the party because it's, it's, it's just seems, uh, I mean, it's, it's, I, I feel like Keir Starmer has tried to humiliate Jeremy Corbyn. And I, I think that's really disgraceful after a campaign where what he said he was doing was trying to unite the party and take the best from Jeremy Corbyn. What members want, I think, this is the impression I have, is they want the policies of Jeremy Corbyn with someone who is more popular, you know, someone who can deal with the media a little bit better, who won't go into a general election as sort of 
destroyed and battered as, as Jeremy Corbyn did, let's be frank. And what Keir Starmer seems to be threatening to do is saying, oh, let's actually park the whole of the past five years. Let's sort of hide that in a cupboard somewhere. And what we're going to return to um, is the kind of Labour Party that we had under Tony Blair. And I think the suspension of, of, of Jeremy Corbyn speaks to that. It is unfortunate that whilst um, we can, in, in some sense, see these elections to the NEC as a bit of a referendum on you know, what direction do members want the party to go in, and definitely the left have come out on top there because of the inbuilt majority on the NEC for Keir Starmer. I, I don't know how much effect this is going to have on that suspension of Jeremy Corbyn, which is what we are going to talk about next, um, because um, there is another controversy um, in the Labour Party going on at the moment, uh, you know, over and above the suspension of Jeremy Corbyn, which is that people are now being suspended for objecting to Jeremy Corbyn's suspension, or at least to hearing motions in their CLPs, in their constituency Labour parties, about Jeremy Corbyn's suspension. Um, this was news which was published in Labour List again, um, which is, at the time that they wrote this, it was members in Bristol West, including the chair and the co-secretary and, and other members had been threatened with suspension. Now many of them have actually been suspended. Um, and they have been suspended for voting on a motion which objected to the suspension of, of Jeremy Corbyn and believed it was politically motivated and also for tweets encouraging a regional director to resign. I mean, if it was if it was against party rules to call for someone to resign, then the 170 MPs which took part who took part in the chicken coup in 2016 should also not be in the party, right? So I don't really see how calling for someone to resign should be a suspendable offence. The reason I think they sort of called for him to resign is because, one, he tried to block them um, hearing the motion about Jeremy Corbyn, and two, he blocked a donation to ACORN, which is a, a sort of housing activism group, a very, very worthy cause, actually. Um, to go into some of the background of this, into these suspensions, which I personally think are disgraceful, there is an email from David Evans, who is the Labour Party General Secretary. This was after Corbyn's suspension. He emailed all local party secretaries and wrote the following. I must remind you that in, in, in accordance with the instructions of my predecessor, which I fully agree with, it is not competent business for CLPs, branches and any other party units to have discussions about or pass motions in relation to any aspect of individual disciplinary cases. He warned that the party will not hesitate to take appropriate action, including against individual members where our rules and guidance are not adhered to or standards of behaviour fall below that which we expect. Um, so obviously uh, people in this CLP um, against um, the, the warnings of, of David Evans, heard a motion supporting Jeremy Corbyn. Now they've all been suspended. Um, the response from Darren McLauch McLaughlin, who is co-secretary of Bristol West Labour Party, presumably one of the people who's been suspended, is very good. Um, so he told Labour List, the anti-democratic suspension of Jeremy Corbyn has rightly been a topic of huge debate within the party. Because of this, it is absolutely right that members should be able to have their say, as Keir Starmer does, in every interview he gives. And that final point is the one that I think is, is, is the most important, because basically what is happening in the Labour Party now is the General Secretary, in consultation with Keir Starmer, we know he consulted Keir Starmer because the Labour Party have said so, they have suspended Jeremy Corbyn for saying something true about the EHLC report. We can debate whether or not it was well-timed. I personally don't think it was amazingly timed, but I think the idea that you should be suspended for a, a, a poorly timed but true statement is ridiculous, anti-democratic. Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn has been suspended. I think it's political. Um, Keir Starmer gets to go out on the airwaves and say, oh, I think it was the right decision. I totally back the suspension. He's a political person in the party. He's the, he's the most political. He's the leader. And they're using bureaucratic methods now to say it's only us who are allowed to have a voice. We, at the top of the party, can have opinions about this suspension. You, at the bottom of the party, you have to be silent or we're going to kick you out. And you can see how this is absolutely weighting everything in the favour of, of the leadership, even though, as these NEC elections have shown, the membership is in a very different place. So Keir Starmer got elected saying, look, I want to bring the party together. I want to create unity. What has he done? Probably the most, more, a more divisive act than I think anyone could have imagined um, in that leadership election. Even the most you know, cynical opponents of Keir Starmer did not suggest that he was going to, within six months, suspend Jeremy Corbyn they, they did not, right? He has way surpassed anyone's expectations of how divisive Keir Starmer could be as Labour leader. There's a huge mandate from, from below, from the members, to say, let's, no, let's stick to a progressive direction. Why, why don't you stick to your original unity platform, Keir Starmer? That's why there are five members from the left slate who have been elected to the NEC and only three from the right wing slate 
which is ostensibly the, the Keir Starmer supporting slate. And the only way it seems that, that Keir Starmer can make moves like suspending Jeremy Corbyn without any significant backlash is if they ban people from talking about it. And one, it's completely undemocratic. And also, and this is the thing that really annoys me, it's really unnecessary. You know, Keir Starmer could easily have said about Jeremy Corbyn, I don't think what he said was well-timed. I don't really agree with what he said, but obviously we cannot suspend people from the Labour Party for having an analysis which differs from my own about what happened over the last five years. And I think the fact that he is, has, has got himself into this situation where they are silencing members for opposing the suspension of the Labour leader who only six months ago Keir Starmer said he wanted to create unity with is... It, it just goes beyond our worst sort of fears about Keir Starmer as leader of the Labour Party. Dahlia, I know, I know the sort of internal workings of the Labour Party is not necessarily your biggest passion, but I do want your thoughts on this. I mean, both on, on the NEC election results, which really show that the, the left in, among the membership is still committed to the politics they have been for the past five years, and the attempt from the top of the party to try and sort of quash through bureaucratic disciplinary measures any opposition to their incredibly controversial decision to suspend the, the former leader. Yes, I think what this is really telling us is the over, I think the overall political objective here um, is very similar to the one that we mentioned earlier in the show around with Joe Biden's win. Um, which is, as we have seen since 2015, we've seen a kind of um, the, the expression of a polarization of the you know, political spectrum in the sense that you know, we have this crisis after crisis and people are needing and wanting and desiring transformational change. Um, it took the center by surprise uh, and they you know, have, were sort of shell-shocked for the past four or five years and now are basically have like, Dusted, that dusted off and are now ready to reconsolidate power and sort of go back to quote unquote normal, the very normal that got us in this situation to begin with. Um, I think that the overall political objective here, you know, it, it, it's very easy to look at this and say, you know, why, why, why the needless provocation? Like the suspension of Jeremy Corbyn was a needless, felt like a very unprovoked attack. Um, I think the reason uh, is to precisely demobilize and push out members of the party that um, pose a threat or sort of like pose sort of like are the front of that or, or a reminder of that expression of desire for transformational change. And that is happening across centrist parties um, who are sort of trying to regain their focus after having been shell-shocked for the past four or five years. Um, you know, we, we often say, well, this is going to cost him, you know, this is going to cost the Labour Party so many members. That's not a loss. That is a win um, because a small party is easier to control. Um, and there is a kind of sense of we don't want this kind of like these transformational demands to be given legitimacy um, at the highest stages of, of at the highest state stages of politics. And we see the exact same thing in the U.S., with Joe Biden sort of immediately as he's won, um, despite the fact that it is, you know, black people, working class people that got him the vote. It wasn't the white suburban vote, which he was sort of really angling for. But um, he is absolutely kind of like turning his back on anything that could be on the inclusion of, of um, progressive members in his, in his um, administration and also sort of turning his back on the policies, not that he ever really embrace them. But I think that this is a very superficial attempt um, to kind of go back to that ostensible normal, to go back to, you know, the famous kind of like obsession with the 2012 Olympics, where everything was fine, um, except it wasn't. People were getting displaced, people were, we were still on our way to climate breakdown, um, we still hadn't resolved the core issues that have led to the financial crisis. So once again, it's trying to put a lid on change that will come about or will be demanded regardless. It's just whether or not it happens through a party or whether it, or not it happens through kind of like a more social movement um, route. So I think that when you look at it through that lens, um, the behavior of people like Biden and Keir Starmer makes a lot more sense um, to not see it as 
um, oh, well, you know, like, why is he turning back his back on the people that got him elected? Well, I think in a sense, it's trying to kind of remind the people that got him elected that you don't belong um, in this kind of level of politics. Mm. I agree. I mean, it's quite depressing, but I mean, also a very, you know, very realistic end um, to the show tonight, Dahlia. It has been a pleasure, as always, um, to be joined by you on Tisky Sour. We're going to make sure that your sound is, is 100% sorted next Friday, because I couldn't bear those moments where I couldn't hear what you were saying. Um, and thank you, everyone, for watching Tisky Sour this evening. If you do want to support what we do, do please go to navarramedia.com forward slash support and donate the equivalent of one hour's wage a month. Also, we have... We've had about 2,500 of you watching the show most of the evening. We've got 869 likes. That can definitely go over 1,000 in the next 30 seconds um, before we go off air. Um, but for now, um, you've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night.